Thank you very much for the opportunity to join you. And I know this is the end of a two-day conference, and so uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, try to be brief. And also, because of course it's very important you have an opportunity to ask questions or just to give comments and advice. Uh, I've seen the presentation that Mark Wolpert gave yesterday morning, must seem like an age ago, when he sort of set the framework. And that's very much the government's perspective, and I've, I very much share that excellent analysis that he set forward. Um, but let me just kind of set, it in a, set out really, therefore, the policy response to the kind of framework that he set out then. Uh, and the starting point for the policy that we've got on open access can be described in, in several ways. You could get into the, the simple statement of principle that when we have publicly funded research, it seems right that the taxpayer shouldn't have to pay twice for access to research that they themselves have paid for in the first place. And I think that is a good, strong principle. I had my own personal experience uh, writing my book about fairness between the generations without being a member of the academic community. And I think people inside the academic community don't always quite appreciate the strength of the paywalls that stand between your internal access to documents within the academic community and those of us outside it. So I found all the time I was trying to access uh, research papers and was endlessly finding myself hitting paywalls and requirements to subscribe to journals, uh, which I found quite a significant barrier. I did have, and um, one of the things that I found very helpful, and I think a lot of people do this, is you end up using your intern or researcher sitting within, on the other side of the academic paywall, to help you access all this material. But it was a significant barrier between me as a lay external researcher and publicly funded research. And then a third way of looking at what we've got to do is that uh, I, I do think I buy the argument that although research is, of course, worthwhile in its own right, in the modern economy, the speed and efficiency with which knowledge is transmitted and available is crucial for progress. I was very, I've been very influenced by the uh, book by Joel Mockier, Gifts of Athena, which is a kind of modern information-based interpretation of the Industrial Revolution, turning to the question that economic historians have debated for decades. Why did England have the Industrial Revolution first? And his argument was that crucial to all this was the network of learned societies and publications and an open press and a, a more efficient mechanism whereby individual technical advances that might be made by one technician, scientist, practitioner somewhere could be spread more widely. He has an argument about 18th century England being more efficient at communicating technical advances than any previous society. So there's a, there's a uh, legitimate set of arguments for progress on open access. And after I commissioned Janet Finch to do her excellent report and she published her findings, which I and the government have accepted, I think we've made a lot of progress. As you all know, we have, we have set out a, a mechanism, a route to gold open access, as well as also providing for green open access. I do have a preference for gold open access. I like gold open access because I think it's got a kind of rustic integrity to it. If we want something, we pay for it. We pay for it clearly and specifically, and the research documents are available straight away. I, just, I like that, and I think myself that communication of findings should be seen as an inherent part of the research process and should be funded out of the research grants. Now, I realize that as we have a science ring fence, that in turn raises issues about, oh, well, is there a, does it come with too high a cost? But for about 60 million, and we haven't got all that straight away, but for about 60 million, you're talking about something that's only around 1% of the total science budget, and having that as part of the communication element of research, I think, is legitimate. But we fully understand that we don't have the funding to go all the way to gold and that there is also perfectly legitimately the green option as well. And in turn, we understand that because the half-life of, of research papers is, it differs between disciplines, that the green option is going to look rather different if you are, say, in medical science, where these things move very rapidly indeed from when you're in, say, the humanities. 
So uh, I think that is a, an important way forward. It does, of course, encounter doubts, controversy, questions. I think to some extent, uh, it's got the policy of open access has got caught up in some other detail, uh, deeper kind of cultural currents within universities. Um, the anxiety on the humanities, that the value of the humanities is not understood, which I hope is wrong. I completely believe in a research base that sustains a very wide range of disciplines. And there are very few problems that can be understood and addressed just through the, the, uh, the perspective of one particular academic discipline. And of course, because of the rather different model in the humanities, the green provision provides for a rather longer half-life. Though I would add, I, I think the humanities are probably underestimating the potential within the humanities for a shift to open access to improve public access and transform public access to their own disciplines. I think there is more upside in this for the humanities than some of the comments from some people in the humanities would suggest. Another cross-current sort of cultural tension within universities that open access has encountered is whether you trust the management. And uh, any large organization, universities are now large organizations, um, with budgets running into hundreds of millions of pounds, or occasionally billions of pounds, has to have some kind of management structure to it. Um, I hope it doesn't interfere, interfere with the uh, necessary freedoms and autonomy of researchers, but sometimes some of the pictures of sort of university managers won't provide the funding for my research to be paid for, to be actually published, suggests a kind of picture of what people uh, in universities with the power over funding, how they behave, that I hope isn't true. And if it is true, then we have some deeply fun problems of dysfunctionality within our universities if universities don't wish to uh, pay for the communication of research findings from their younger researchers. But those are sort of the kind of, and I'm aware of this because of all the controversy about university reforms over the last year, these are just kind of undercurrents that you get that, he, that cut across almost anything you do with regard to universities. These are deep-seated anxieties within universities and they are not going to be solved overnight, but we have to recognize that they are genuinely felt by some academics. Um, and as well as green and gold, there are other bits of open access that sometimes get overshadowed by green and gold, but I think are also worthwhile and are areas where we're making good progress. The, the gateway to research, a better single gateway that enables people to access information about all the publicly funded research that is going on in the UK, where we already have a rather clunky beta format for this research gateway that is already live, and obviously there's a lot of work going on led by research councils to improve that and make it much more user-friendly in a genuine one-stop shop single portal. And of course, we've also had from the publishers, as, <coughs> as part of the rather fraught negotiations we were having with them, we've also got this commitment to a national license for all our libraries so that the citizen should be able to go into a library and see online via, uh, uh, via terminals in the library. They should be able to uh, have walk-in access to um, a very wide range of research material indeed. So I think we are making considerable progress in open access. Um, some people say it's all going too fast, but you know, this is this has already taken um, almost two years with a proper a report by Janet Finch in which a whole range of different viewpoints are reflected, the publication of that report, its acceptance, the process of developing a government policy. Uh, but I fully understand we, this is not a process that can end now. And we've already said, and I've asked Research Councils UK to do this, that for example, next year we'll have to have a very careful review of how it's working. Are some of the anxieties that are being expressed about the consequences of this, are they coming to pass or not? I wouldn't, for example, wish to see the sudden disappearance of large numbers of scholarly publications or indeed scholarly societies. Um, that's something to uh, keep an eye on. So this is work in progress and of course the policy can be refined and adjusted as the evidence comes in, but you have to start somewhere. And although 
uh, it's an, an open question. I think probably on balance we have first mover advantage rather than disadvantage. I think that it's better to be shaping an international debate. Um, and I know from my conversations with John Holdren, the, the President's Science Advisor in the US, or with representatives of the Commission, that what we've done is influencing them. They will have their own uh, different uh, proposals, but I think we are, we are not isolated in this move. I think it is a move that is happening around the world in all the major research funders. And I have to say, the other reason for getting on with it is there is a nightmare scenario where you kind of just try to preserve a status quo, which is being challenged massively both by technological changes and cultural changes. And um, if you look at other industries that have tried to ignore these type of movements, look at the, the, the Napster moment, and then finally we get Spotify. Wouldn't it, be a, wouldn't it be great if the music industry had understood that something like Spotify was where they were probably going to head anyway, rather than spending years trying to fight off the inevitable. And I think these type of big changes are afoot in academic publishing, almost regardless of the structure of public policy, but we can at least try to steer them and play a constructive role rather than ignoring them and being caught out by unforeseen consequences. So that's where we are on open access. I think in the last few minutes, before you all put your questions and comments, I'd like to talk about what increasingly now is preoccupying me, um, and that is open data, where I have a, a role tra uh, chairing um, what we are calling a research sector transparency board. And that's really, we've put at the heart of that agenda, trying to tackle some of the challenges identified by Jeffrey Bolton and others on the um, access to data. And that does seem to me a really important challenge where there's still a hell of a lot to do because the, the research documents, the, the papers, the published papers are only, well, probably less than, well, you're the scientist, not me, but they're less than half the story. It's the data underpinning the research documents, which is really crucial. And I remember sitting in a group of the main Western funders of medical research. And we just thought, imagine that the data that lies behind all the publicly funded studies of cancer that have been produced in the US, in the UK, in Canada, in Germany, France, wherever, in the past 20 years. Imagine that the data behind all that publicly financed medical research was all equally available and accessible for future medical researchers. You would have an incredibly powerful tool. And we don't really have that at the moment. Though there is different progress being made in different ways in different disciplines. And that I see is the, is the challenge. And of course, again, there is a lot happening outside government. I think you know, Galaxy Zoo, by all accounts, began in an Oxford pub. And uh, as many of the world's great ideas, I'm sure, have originated. Um, so there's a lot that happens anyway with harnessing um, citizen access to data, collaborative science, generating data sets. My son was, his laptop overnight was doing protein folding work for, uh, as part of another science project. And he really found that an exciting and exhilarating way of thinking he could play a sort of bit part in a wider scientific endeavor. This is an incredibly exciting thing, and we need to try to sustain it, support it, and harness it. Now, what are the challenges there? Three or four areas of kind of public debate. First of all, the paradox. Although I've been talking about open, uh, uh, open data, one of the first things that we are doing under, uh, because of uh, very powerful arguments presented by the academic community, is trying to uh, recognize in legislation the need to protect the rawest data that you have in your lab notes and that you assemble pre the publication of your research findings from FOI requests. Now this is something the academic community came up with very strongly and it's interesting because we're always told that the academic community has an entirely an open data agenda. Part of the agenda was we have to have be an individual scientific researcher has to have uh, the first opportunity, the first chance to present the data that he or she has been uh, creating and developing 
um, in their own publication, first of all. And there was some uncertainty. I'm not, we're not sure how genuine uh, really a problem it was. There was some uncertainty. What if there's an FOI request for my lab notes before I've been able to publish my paper? Am I obliged under FOI to release that? Now, that would have been a matter of uh, judgment ultimately in the courts. We'd already published guidelines that said this should be protected in all reasonable circumstances. But we have recognized that in the light of the uncertainty and anxieties in the community, we'll essentially try to bring uh, parity with the Scottish regime so that um, there will be a Scottish type FOI exemption for research data pre-publication, provided, of course, there are, there are no unreasonable delays in in the publication. So that's the first thing we're doing. Secondly, we know that we need to get a better legal framework in place for text and data mining for research, and that is what Hargreaves has called for, and um, we are intending to legislate on that. Um, there's more to be done, including getting the legal framework right at the European level, and we're still working on that, um, but we do need to try to ensure a, a, a useful legal framework for text and data mining. Um, the third thing that we need to do is have the hardware and software in place. And in the successive negotiations that I've had with the Chancellor of the Exchequer since our original public expenditure plans were published in the summer of 2010, I've always found him someone that you could persuade about the value of capital investment in science. The initial judgment we took in the summer of 2010, of course, was to have a science and research ring fence that protected all current expenditure. It was actually, in that respect, a broader ring fence than we'd had before. It included not just all the research councils, including, of course, the social sciences and arts humanities research councils. It also includes all the QR funding coming from HEFKE. But it was for current funding. And we inherited plans overall from the previous government for a big reduction in capital. And gradually, in each autumn statement in budget, we've been able to put back significant investment into science capital as well on top of the ring fence. And one of the highest priorities there has been high performance computing, both the hardware and the other resources you need to ensure that we are properly able to um, uh, deliver a high quality data infrastructure in the UK. Um, that adds up to over £350 million of investment in things like um, bioinformatics. And um, I'm chairing an e-infrastructure council, which is aimed at ensuring that we continue just to invest in the right way, obviously, the decisions taken by the academics. So we've also been trying to sustain that. The, the, um, as well as the, the hardware and the software programming, there is the human capacity to assist and advise on the organization of data. And I do think this is probably one of the biggest challenges we face. This is modern librarianship. This is the ensuring that the data that is being generated probably by every one of you in this room is available in a form that is accessible in standard formats that can be uh, linked in to data being assembled by a Chinese scientist. And that is a massive challenge, and, it and I don't expect, I'm certainly not an expert in this, but I think many of you probably aren't experts in it. You are here because you are physicists or chemists or biochemists or whatever, not necessarily experts on the exact organization and interconnectivity of large data sets. And I think that's where um, there is a real problem of ensuring a proper, a proper career advising and assisting in those type of tasks. As I said, modern librarianship and um, we do, uh, and one of the main tasks of the, of the research uh, transparency, what I was describing, was to see if there's anything more we need to do to sustain that and grow that type of expertise. And then fifth on my list is, is the privacy question. And uh, there are large data sets where privacy is very important. And if you ask me one of the things that would derail all this, the nightmare scenario, Imagine that we make progress with the Prime Minister's very ambitious task of the uh, sequencing the genomes of 100,000 NHS patients. And for some reason, through some extraordinary set of accidents, um, an identifiable genetic 
sequence of an NHS patient became available. The health research equivalent of the notorious treasury loss of the, of the CD with those 25 million child benefit uh, details. Something like that really uh, would set the cause back enormously. And something where um, in Whitehall, with my responsibilities in science and research, and with the NHS's responsibilities for patients and thinking about patients, there are very uh, lively discussions going on about exactly how you ensure you've got all the right protections in place. So a patient in the NHS who is happy for their genome to be sequenced for the causes of research um, is properly protected. And that's also true of administrative data. We are currently grossly underusing the large amount of administrative data we collect. It's shocking how, how we don't use this to understand our own society far better uh, than we do at the moment. We really could do a lot more with it, but again, you've got to be absolutely, there are now some rather clunky um, legal protections in place. We need to ensure that social scientists can access far more of this, but in return, there will have to be a much more sophisticated regime to ensure confidentiality. So there's a, a set of privacy issues. And I have to say, sometimes I, I find some scientists are a bit casual about this agenda and regard it as just an obstacle to good research. If this were ever to go wrong, the cause would be set back by many years. So there are some, some important policy challenges, and you will have others I'm sure you'd want to add to the list where we need to do more on policy, and I'd be very interested to hear about that. Um, but finally, let me, let me say that behind all this, there is an incredibly exciting agenda of data-driven science. I buy the argument um, that this is something where we really can see um, a large amount of... Um, extraordinary valuable scientific progress in the future. And just to give you, again, a layman's example, um, down at Harwell the other week, I was at the, at the um, satellite application centre we've got there, trying to get people who aren't in any ways directly involved with space science or space research or understand the functioning of and the range of activities that, um, and data that satellites now collect people from completely different other walks of life, realizing the power of data from satellites. And they'd had a hackathon all weekend of people um, coming in and trying to uh, write programs with innovative new ways of using simply the data that was being collected off satellites. And the winner was two guys who had not been to university, who had... Uh, use the data that was being collected by some of our weather climate uh, satellites uh, to get very precise information about climate conditions in Rwanda, where one of the main products is coffee. And they were using this, they'd written a program that enabled you to analyze this data to do two things. First, to establish when climate conditions were such that the pest, I can't even remember its name, but there's a pest that affects coffee beans. When that pest was most likely to be thriving, so that it was the time to apply the insecticide, and also the time when climate conditions were such as to favor beans that had the taste that Nestle wanted. So when you could maximize the value of your beans and you could tell Nestle that you had got beans that had been grown in the conditions that they wanted and would pay a premium price for. And then through the mobile phones, and of course large parts of Africa use their mobile phones with much greater sophistication than we do in the UK, through mobile phone uh, links to thousands of Rwandan coffee farmers, they could in turn convey that information. All that is going on all around the world. That's what you can do when you make data available to um, smart and ingenious people. We want to do far more of it, and I think it offers me great um, optimism for the future of science and research. Thank you very much indeed.